Have you ever wondered how both jet engines on a jet could quit, as they did on the Challenger that crashed at Naples earlier this month? And did you know that 30 years ago, another Challenger experienced a dual flameout? Stick around and we'll tell you about the similarities between those accidents. Hello and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation. My name is Max Truscott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And our mission here is to help you become the safest possible pilot. Last week, we talked about my recent trip in a vision jet from California to Michigan and back. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 316. And if you're new to this show, welcome. Nice to have you here. Now just take a moment and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And of course, this is a listener-supported show, and I'll tell you more about that later. Coming up on the news for the week of February 26, 2024, the preliminary report is out for the Challenger that had a dual engine failure at Naples, a Florida man attempts to steal an airplane, and we'll tell you about the world's shortest airline flight and the GA aircraft used on those flights. All this and more, and the news starts now. From NTSB.gov, preliminary report on Challenger Jet at Naples, you may recall that the aircraft was on final when it had a rare dual engine failure. The plane attempted to land on I-75 but hit a light pole, which spun it into a sound wall. The two pilots were killed, but the two passengers and a flight attendant escaped. A preliminary review of the data recovered from the airplane's flight data recorder revealed that the first of three master warnings was recorded at 3.09 p.m. in 33 seconds, and that was a left engine oil pressure. One second later, right engine oil pressure warning, and six seconds later, an engine warning. The system alerted pilots with elimination of a master warning light on the glare shield, a corresponding red message on the crew alerting system page, and a triple chime voice advisory, engine oil. Fuel contamination is a possibility, and I'll talk more during our main topic about what the NTSB found when they examined the fuel and fuel system, and I'll tell you about another rare double engine failure that occurred in a Challenger 30 years ago. From CBS.com, Florida man accused of attempting to steal plane crashes into light pole. A man is accused of trying to steal a plane from an airport in Fort Myers on Monday. The Lee County Sheriff's Office responded to the Pagefield Airport to assist the Lee County Port Authority with a burglary incident. The Port Authority officers told detectives two maintenance personnel saw an aircraft off its designated ramp and in the grass with a broken wing crushed against a light pole and an open door. In addition to the plane, detectives found a ballistic vest, magazines with ammunition, and an assault rifle nearby. After reviewing surveillance video, detectives said they were able to identify the suspect as a 43-year-old man. In the video, he's seen entering and exiting a plane, turning on the lights of another, and moving one of the planes into the grass out of camera view. A search warrant was issued for his vehicle and home. At the house, detectives said they found more evidence connecting him to the crimes at the airport. His criminal history consists of several DUIs and violation of probation. He was booked into the county jail for armed burglary of an unoccupied conveyance, grand theft of over $100,000, and possession of a bulletproof vest while committing certain offenses. From the Watsonville Pilots Association in Watsonville, California, they're asking for your help in saving Watsonville's crosswind runway. And just as background, Watsonville is about 35 miles from me and is located close to the Monterey Bay. It has two runways. Runway 20 points toward the ocean, and it's used most of the time. There's also a runway 9 and 27, which the city council might close or shorten. The association is asking pilots to add their name to a letter that urges the Watsonville City Council to reconsider the closure or undue shortening of the crosswind runway at the airport. They say this runway is essential to aviation safety, the regional transportation infrastructure, and the airport community. The Watsonville Pilots Association has overwhelming consensus around the facts in their letter, and they thank members, local businesses, and national organizations for their initial input and endorsement. And they say, we encourage you to share this call to action with other organizations or individuals. And they say we must submit this letter to the city council before they reconvene in March. The deadline to sign is on March 6th, 2024. Please sign in, show your support. And we'll have a link to that letter in our show notes. And if there's any way you can attend the council meeting in Watsonville, California, please do. That meeting is currently scheduled for March 19th. From avweb.com. 
Textron pauses orders for Bonanzas and Barons. Textron has confirmed it's not currently taking orders for new Beechcraft Bonanzas, but it won't say why it has stopped or when it might resume accepting them. To ensure the best experience for our customers throughout every stage of their ownership journey, Textron Aviation has temporarily suspended additions to the order book for the Beechcraft Bonanza, a company spokesman said. AvWeb asked for more details on the suspension, but a spokesperson said she could not offer any elaboration on the initial statement. Now, I exchanged messages with Tom Turner, executive director of the ABS Air Safety Foundation. He told me that Textron Aviation sales reps were telling attendees at last October's Beach Party Fly-In at the Beechcraft Heritage Museum that Textron Aviation was, quote, sold out for 2024 and was no longer taking orders for new airplanes. He notes that sales, but not production, have been paused indefinitely and that Textron Aviation has backlogged through 2027, but does not say how many airplanes that represents. He says, I note that given only five deliveries each of Bonanzas and Barons in 2023, either that backlog is not a lot of airplanes or for some reason Textron cannot produce them more rapidly. From GeneralAviationNews.com, helmet bag blocks controls during takeoff. And this comes from a NASA ASRS report written by the pilot. He wrote, I placed my small overnight bag and backpack on the rear seat in my aircraft and secured it with a seatbelt. I then placed my helmet bag with my flight helmet in it on my backpack with the intention of securing it with a seatbelt as well. I must have gotten distracted as I forgot to secure the helmet bag prior to departure. During my takeoff roll, about the time the tailwheel came up, I felt or heard something and as soon as I broke ground I could feel a resistance when I tried to move the stick to the right. I realized that my helmet bag had fallen to the floor in the rear cockpit and it was either blocking the controls or binding the exposed aileron cable pulley. After a couple of tries, I was able to free the bag and then held it on my lap for the remainder of the flight. During my attempts to free the bag, I drifted left of the runway by several hundred feet and was over the hangars at approximately 100 feet AGL when I corrected back to the right. Due to the other traffic in the left pattern, I opted to just continue to depart to the west and then northwest in the direction of my destination. The rest of the flight went smoothly. After some reflection, I realized that there were probably two contributing factors to my failure to secure the bag. I had not slept well the two previous nights. Some noise at the hotel kept waking me up, had spent two days in the sun at the air show, and had not eaten much the day this happened. I was in a hurry to get back to my destination in the daylight, as I prefer not to fly my aircraft at night. And also from GeneralAviationNews.com, student pilot accidentally pulls a mixture control. And this comes from an NTSB final report. It says, the student pilot reported that he did two successful touch-and-go landings with his instructor. The CFI then got out of the Cessna 150, and the student pilot took off solo to practice in the pattern of the airport in Burleson, Texas. While on downward in the pattern, the student pilot accidentally pulled the mixture knob and the engine quit. He attempted to restart the engine, but was unsuccessful. He tried to land the airplane in a nearby field, but hit a stand of trees and then hit the ground nearly vertical. The airplane sustained substantial damage to the wings and forward fuselage. The student pilot reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the airplane. Probable cause, the student pilot accidentally pulling the mixture control in the landing pattern, which resulted in a loss of engine power and forced landing. Now, this pilot was extremely lucky as he was not injured. I looked at the photo in the report and the aircraft hit the ground nearly vertically. The pilot had 24 hours of total time, just seven hours the prior 90 days, and only four hours in the prior 30 days. And I would add that if something goes wrong in an airplane, you might consider undoing the last thing that you did. I had someone pull the mixture instead of the throttle once while in the pattern on downwind, and I quickly pushed the mixture in before the engine quit completely. From verticalmag.com, HAI becomes Vertical Aviation International. Helicopter Association International, or HAI, has rebranded itself as Vertical Aviation International, or VAI, unveiling its new name and logo at the association's annual Heli Expo trade show in Anaheim, California this past week. Along with a new logo, VAI has also renamed its trade show to Verticon, the first edition of that rebranded show will take place in Dallas in March 2025. James Viola, president and CEO of VAI, said the helicopter term in its previous name was limiting and didn't represent the entire industry. Quote, if you fly it, fix it, maintain it, or help with the infrastructure, we want to make sure that we are the association representing you. 
as far as a rebranding. Number one was that we wanted to make sure that Vertical Aviation International represents all of the capabilities of vertical aviation. VAI started in 1948 as California-based Helicopter Council, representing six companies in what was then a very new industry. Today, VAI represents the global vertical aviation industry, including all aircraft capable of vertical or short takeoff and landing. VAI's new website, verticalavi.org, is planned to launch this summer. And finally, from ScottishConstructionNow.com, Orkney Bridge may end the world's shortest flight. Now, this is an older article, but still interesting. It says the air link between Westray and Papa Westray could be grounded by a scheme to build tunnels, bridges, and causeways between a number of Orkney's islands, the Scotsman has reported. Now, the Orkney Islands are about 70 islands that are off the coast of Scotland. It says the 1.7-mile journey from Westray to Papa Westray attracts flight fans from all over the world. The record flight time from the wheels coming up to touching down again is 52 seconds. But Orkney Islands Council is now looking at a series of fixed links involving seven islands. And according to Wikipedia, this route is flown by Logan Air, a Scottish regional airline that serves Scotland's highlands and islands. It's also part of a connector flight that links the island of Westray and the town of Kirkwall, the central and most populous town of the Orkney Islands. Flights between Westray and Papa Westray airports occur daily in both directions, except on Saturdays when only flights from Westray to Papa Westray are available, and on Sunday. The total distance covered by the flights is 1.7 miles. Logan Air operates this flight with one of its two Britain Norman BN-2B-26 Islander aircraft. The Islander is a high-wing, twin-piston engine, propeller-driven aircraft. It's flown by a single pilot, and there is seating for eight passengers in the cabin. One additional seat usually remains empty next to the pilot. And I've actually had one flight aboard a Highlander, and that was as I was interviewing for jobs fresh out of college, and I was on a flight from San Francisco to Santa Rosa to interview with HP in Santa Rosa. That's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And later, we'll talk about two Challenger jets that have had dual-engine flameouts. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. <laughs> Now let's get to the good news. Congratulations, Theodore Hockenberry. He writes, recently got my private after starting the process in 2008. Listening to you weekly greatly helped educate and motivate me. That's fantastic. So happy to be of help to you. And this show will be a little shorter today because I'm away from my home studio this week. I'm visiting my daughter and my 18-month-old grandson all week in Napa, California. My son-in-law is away on business, so we came out to help out. And my daughter, by the way, is working at the CIA. Yes, that one. You know, the Culinary Institute of America. <laughs> and I cracked up the first time I visited the building here in Napa, which has huge letters on the side of the building. It says CIA. Anyway, it's a little tough recording from a spare bedroom here as there's a lot of noise, which means I'm constantly re-recording some sections to eliminate the noise. Anyway, things should be a little easier when I get back home next week. Now, Rob Mark sent me a link today to the preliminary report on the Hawker that crashed on the border of Utah and Colorado earlier in the month. That crash happened two days before the Naples, Florida crash that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. It adds a little new information. You may recall that I said that the aircraft appeared to be on autopilot at flight level 200 as it slowed about 100 knots to begin maneuvers. The preliminary report says in part, the airplane arrived at Westar Aviation's facility at Grand Junction Regional Airport in Grand Junction, Colorado on December 20th, 2023, for routine maintenance. According to preliminary information from the maintenance facility, multiple routine inspections had been completed on the airplane, including a requirement to remove the wing leading edges and TKS panels to inspect for cracks and signs of corrosion. After the inspections were complete, the airplane was returned to service on February 6, 2024. The flight crew had planned to fly the airplane from Grand Junction to Gig Harbor, Washington on the day of the accident, during which time they would perform a stall warning and systems check in accordance with the airframe manufacturer's requirements. These requirements, which were listed in the POH, included a required altitude above 10,000 feet above ground level, 10,000 feet above clouds, and below 18,000 feet MSL. In addition, this check flight could only be conducted during day VMC conditions with a good visual horizon with the autopilot disengaged, an operative stall identification system, the external surfaces free of ice, 
the ventral tank empty, and weather radar on standby. According to preliminary ADSB data, the airplane departed Grand Junction at 10.37 a.m. and entered a climb on a southeast heading. The crew asked ATC for a block of altitude from flight level 180 to flight level 200, and ATC approved the request. At 10.46, the flight track data showed the aircraft began a rapid descent in circular patterns that resembled the shape of a corkscrew. The airplane made multiple rotations before the track ceased at 10.47. So, for sure this crew was 2,000 feet higher than they should have been, and it appears from the data that they were doing this stall with the autopilot engaged. Also from Rob Mark, he recently found a tape that he recorded in 1983, so over 40 years ago, while he was working as an air traffic controller on a Saturday afternoon at the Powaukee Airport, now called Chicago Executive. I thought I'd play a short segment of it for you to see just how busy that airport was back then. Here it is. Okay, Tower 5, so we have to go first. That's 4 Bravo, actually start your right turn to the crosswind as soon as you're able. There's traffic northwest to follow you. 4 Bravo, actually, Roger. Powerlocky Tower, this is 730 to Whiskey X-ray. Over the VOR for landing, negative Vegas. Piper 5-2 Whiskey, your number 4, follow 150 at the northwest corner, turning a right downwind for 30 right. That's it, Whiskey, I'm up for now. Test 4 Kilo Romeo, 30 right, clear touch and go. 4 Kilo Romeo, thank you. Powerlocky Tower, 3 and 6, 4, 8, 4, off is ready to go, 30 right. Test 4 Bravo Hotel, change your runway to, or correction, disregard, that's S4 Kilo Romeo, change your runway to 30 left, clear touch and go, then make left traffic. 4 Kilo Romeo, Roger. Piper 5 9 Lima, make two left turns and ground is 0.7 when you're on 6 left. 5 9. Test 8 4 Alpha, taxi into position, hold, be ready to go. 4 Alpha, position, hold. Test 4 Bravo Hotel, make left traffic, 30 left now. Okay. Make left traffic for 30 left, 4 Bravo Hotel. Bravo Hotel. Piper 5, 2 Whiskey again, your number 2 now, follow traffic uh, midfield right downwind. Thank you, Whiskey, got traffic inside. Thank you, Cessna 8, 4 Alpha, traffic at the departure end of the runway will make a left turn out. You make a right turn to the north, cleared for takeoff. 8, 4 Alpha, on the go. Tower 1, Tower Army 16706. 706. Roger, 706, Army Helicopter at the Yelling Park Race Track. We'd like to fly eastbound, landing at Glenview at uh, 1.5. Army 706, approved at least two south of the airport. Report south of the tower. 706. Now, the full recording runs for 42 minutes, and the airport remains just as busy for the entire time. So you can see why controllers retire at age 56, as us older gents just wouldn't be able to maintain that pace for that long. If you'd like to hear the entire recording, I've included a link to it in our show notes. Now, this past week, we had just two new people sign up to support the show, but get this, they were both women, which is great when you consider that a really large percentage of our audience is men. So I'm going to put the challenge out this week to men to please sign up and support the show next week. But first, let me remind you why I need your help. Every month, we lose perhaps 6 to 12 supporters mostly when people's credit cards have expired and they don't sign into Patreon or PayPal to update their credit cards. So we constantly need an influx of new supporters to replace the supporters we've lost just to stay even. So if you've been listening for a while and you've learned some things from this show, and especially if you've ever thought, yeah, I'm going to make a donation someday. Well, maybe today is that day to show your love and support for the show. Just go out to our new support page at aviationnewstalk.com support where you'll find links to support the show via PayPal, Venmo, the Cash App, Zelle, and Patreon. And when you do make a donation, I'll read your name on the show. Special thanks to Cortland Carpenter, who signed up via Patreon, and to Sally Bertel, who made a one-time donation via Venmo. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about two Challenger accidents, both of which had dual-engine flameouts, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's talk about the Challenger crash in Naples and about another dual engine flameout that occurred in a Challenger in Nebraska 30 years ago. First, let's talk about the oil pressure warnings that the pilots received in Naples for both engines within a second of each other. You might think that these indicated that the engines lost oil pressure for some reason and that that caused the engines to fail. However, it seems unlikely that there's anything common to both engines 
that could cause them both to lose oil pressure at the same time. More likely, those oil pressure warnings were just a byproduct of the engine starting to fail. When an engine starts to fail and slows down, the engine-driven oil pump also slows down, which decreases the oil pressure. So, although the NTSB report doesn't tell us this, my best guess is that the oil pressure warnings were a symptom of the engine starting to fail and not the cause of the failures. And I will say that this dual engine failure is confounding to a lot of people, including me, and it's not at all clear at this point why those engines failed simultaneously. Here's some more details from the preliminary report, and as I read it, I'll add a few of my comments. It says in part, the left main landing gear touched down first in the center of the three lanes, and then the right main landing gear touched down in the right lane. The airplane continued through the breakdown lane and into the grass shoulder area before impacting a concrete sound barrier. After the airplane came to rest, the cabin attendant stated that she identified that the cabin and emergency exits were blocked by fire and coordinated the successful egress of her passengers and herself through the baggage compartment door in the tail section of the airplane. So, great that they had a trained cabin attendant on board. And one comment I read was that they would have had a really hard time getting through that baggage door if the baggage area had been full of luggage and golf clubs. Getting back to the report, it says the ATP-rated captain had a total of 10,525 total hours of flight experience, of which 2,808 hours were in the accident airplane make and model. The first officer had 24,618 total hours of flight experience, of which 138 hours were in the accident airplane make and model. According to FAA and maintenance records, the airplane was manufactured in 2004 and was powered by two GE CF-34 series turbofan engines. The airplane's most recent continuous airworthiness inspection was completed on January 5th, 2024 at 9,763 total hours of operation. The wreckage was fuel-soaked, having an odor consistent with Jet-A fuel, so it seems unlikely that this aircraft ran out of fuel. About 16 ounces of liquid with an odor and appearance consistent with Jet-A was drained from the aft tail fuel tank. The sample contained about a half ounce of what appeared to be water. The auxiliary power unit fuel filter bowl was removed for visual inspection of the fuel and fuel filter. No debris was noted in the drained fuel and the filter appeared clean. The fuel was retained for further analysis. The engines and their respective pylons were cut from the airplane to facilitate recovery. A fuel sample was collected from the number one engine main supply when the engine was cut. However, no fuel was released when the number two engine main supply line was cut. So that's kind of interesting, but it wouldn't explain why both engines failed at the same time. The left engine fan and core assemblies displayed thermal damage consistent with post-impact fire, with some of the cowling consumed. When viewed from the front, all fan blades appeared full length and intact, with no evidence of impact damage to the fan blade leading edges. So that tells us it's unlikely that this was caused by a bird strike. The MFC, or Main Fuel Control Throttle Lever Spindle, lever arm and push-pull rod were connected to the throttle linkage bell crank and appeared undamaged. The red alignment marks on the throttle lever spindle and lever arm were consistent with an idle throttle position. The fuel filter appeared clean and no evidence of debris or foreign material was observed within the filter pleats. Fuel samples were collected from points throughout the fuel system. All samples appeared clear and consistent in odor with Jet A. The fuel flow transmitter was removed, and examination of the inlet and outlet ports revealed them to be unobstructed. Examination of the fuel injectors revealed normal operating signatures. One of the fuel igniters was removed and displayed no anomalies. Visual examination of the MFC, main fuel pump, and main fuel inlet port revealed no anomalies. The oil filter appeared in good condition, and no particles were observed within the pleats. Now for the number two or right engine... The right engine spinner cone, access cowls, translating assembly cowls, and exhaust fairing displayed thermal damage. When viewed from the inlet, all fan blades appeared full length with minimal leading edge or blade tip damage. The MFC throttle lever and throttle linkage bell crank was observed in a position consistent with being forward of the idle stop. The fuel filter bowl displayed evidence of thermal discoloration. The filter appeared clean with no debris or foreign material within the pleats. Fuel samples were collected from various points throughout the fuel system. The fuel from the fuel filter bowl and heat exchanger displayed a yellowish tint while the other fuel samples were clear. The odor of the samples was consistent with Jet A. Examination of the fuel injectors revealed normal operating signatures. One of the two fuel igniters was removed and exhibited no anomalies. 
Visual examination of the MFC and main fuel pump revealed no anomalies. The main fuel inlet port exhibited a small yellow-colored debris particle. The oil filter appeared in good condition, and no particles were observed within the pleats. So that's what we know at this point. The two unusual things from the preliminary report that bear some resemblance to a previous Challenger dual flameout were that the fuel from the right engine displayed a yellowish tint, and that the main fuel inlet port exhibited a small yellow-colored debris particle. Now, after reading the NTSB report, I spoke with one of our PayPal supporters of the show, Ed Verville, and asked him about the preliminary report. Ed currently flies a CL604 Challenger full-time with a Part 135 operation, and was previously a flight simulator instructor, TCE and APD, instructing and evaluating pilots. He said that I had four students shut down the wrong engine while conducting general aviation multi-engine check rides as a DPE, but I have had only one student shut down the wrong engine during a 61.58 proficiency check in the CL604 series. That was a scenario where the pilot monitoring was busy running a checklist. I initiated an engine fire. The pilot flying was impulsive and could not wait for the PM to finish the checklist and start the memory items or checklist for the engine fire. The pilot flying decided to push the engine fire push button that shuts off everything to the engine. The problem was that the pilot pushed the wrong button and now had a double engine failure. Ed said that after he read the preliminary report that he didn't have any clues or thoughts at this time, but he did say that he recalled that the CL601 flight simulator at FSI in Tucson was originally from an actual airplane that experienced a dual engine failure. He said the crew received left and right yellow caution fuel filter messages. He said he didn't recall the exact message, but the checklist said to just monitor. There was a dual engine flame out and they landed in the field. Interestingly, that airplane cockpit from that wreckage became a simulator at flight safety. Now, I use that information to track down the accident, which occurred in 1994, and I'll read from that NTSB report in a moment. But before I read it, I want to mention a comment on Reddit regarding the Naples crash. It said in part, Challenger 605 pilot here, very strange. Within our community, there's been basically theories thrown left and right that gets dismissed right away by the actual facts. Fuel contamination, shutting down both inadvertently, birds, FCU freezing, nothing really makes sense when you look at the flight track. The preliminary report does clarify two very important facts. Dual engine failure happened at the same time, and event did occur in the airport environment. That suggests that we might rule out the theories of undeclared emergency coming single engine and shutting down the wrong one. The report also states that both thrust levers were near idle. I don't know if this has been discussed here, but there's a service bulletin that states, quote, when the throttle is at the climb cruise position, the teeth inside the throttle gearbox can wear. If the teeth wear too much, this could cause the throttle to jam or to move out of position or misrigged. If there was a misrig condition, the movement of the throttle toward the idle position can correspond to a position close to fuel shutoff. This can cause the engine to stop. It is not possible to restart the engine when the situation occurs in the incorrect idle position. But could it have happened to both engines at the same time? In all honesty, being so close to the airport, whatever happened to that airplane, they were very unlucky, and I feel deeply for their families. I fly pretty much the same airframe with upgraded avionics and also based in the same airport. Impossible not to put yourself in their shoes. And someone else commented, there's also an AD or airworthiness directive from 2009 that identifies the throttle as being susceptible to accidental shutdown due to wear of the rack and pinion inside the throttle body. Quote, incidents of throttle jam and engine shutdowns caused by premature wear of the rack and pinion mechanism of part number, they give the part number, engine throttle control gearbox installed on Bombardier CL601 and 604 aircraft. But as someone pointed out, it's hard to imagine that both throttle levers suffered exactly the same problem at the same time. Then someone else said, also on a jet, they wouldn't be going to flight idle on final because unlike a piston, you have to consider spool up time. Thrust shouldn't be going near idle on approach, especially at flaps 45 to which I agree. When I fly the Vision Jet, we're nowhere close to idle power on final, as there's lots of drag to overcome with full flaps and landing gear down. And now here's what the NTSB final report says about that 1994 accident. At Canada Air Challenger 601-3A, November 88 Hotel Alpha, operating as a positioning flight after passenger drop-off, 
experienced a dual engine flameout during cruise flight between flight level 370 and flight level 410 in the vicinity of Bassett, Nebraska. The airplane sustained substantial damage during the subsequent forced landing in an alfalfa field. The two commercial pilots received serious injuries. BMC conditions prevailed for the flight, and the IFR flight plan was in effect. The airplane departed Burlington, Vermont, approximately 9.28 p.m., with an intended destination of Long Beach, California. The flight crew departed their home base of Long Beach at 10.28 a.m. and flew to San Diego. They picked up two passengers and a flight attendant and departed for Boston's Logan Airport in Massachusetts. The flight arrived at Boston at 5.28 p.m., and the passengers and flight attendant to plane. The airplane departed Boston at 6.07 p.m. with only flight crew on board. They flew to Lawrence Municipal Airport in Massachusetts, where they had prearranged a quick turnaround fuel stop for the trip back to Long Beach. The airplane landed at Lawrence Municipal with 3,000 pounds of Jet A on board, and the flight crew planned to take on an additional 12,500 pounds of fuel. The contracted FBO at the airport pumped about 221 U.S. gallons into the airplane before the fuel truck stopped pumping. Attempts to revive the fuel truck were unsuccessful. Approximately two hours after they arrived, the flight crew decided to fly to Burlington, Vermont, to pick up the remainder of their required fuel load. As the flight crew taxied the airplane to the active runway for departure, the FBO manager radioed them to report he found water in the bottom of the fuel truck and wanted to check for contamination in the airplane. The pilot stated, although they believed any water in the fuel would be dispersed due to movement on rough taxiways and mode of flow fuel system, they parked the airplane to draw fuel samples. The manager drove to meet the airplane with a GA-type 3-4 to four ounce fuel strainer, and fuel samples were drawn from several drain points across the airplane. Small amounts of water were found at the belly drain points. The sampling continued until clear samples were obtained. The flight crew departed for BVT about 819 and arrived there approximately 853. They stated the flight to BVT was uneventful except for observed auxiliary tank fuel quantity gauge and fuel totalizer fluctuations. The flight crew reported, as a precautionary measure, they elected to top the airplane off at BVT. The fuel tanks were drained again after fueling at BVT with no evidence of water contamination. The flight crew departed BVT approximately 9.28 p.m. The pilots reported during the flight the impending filter bypass warning light for the left engine illuminated. They monitored other engine indications in accordance with the flight manual and continued en route to Long Beach with the warning light illuminated. The pilot stated the airplane was established on cruise flight at 41,000 feet, approximately two and a half hours into the flight, when the warning light went out. Shortly thereafter, the fuel low pressure and fuel boost pump on lights for the left engine began to flash on and off. At 12.14 a.m. in the morning, the pilots initiated a descent as the left engine began to spool down. They selected continuous ignition, and left engine power was temporarily restored. About two minutes later, the left engine lost power again. The flight crew contacted ATC to request a lower altitude in order to attempt engine restart within the restart envelope. The pilot stated a few minutes later, as the airplane descended through approximately 37,000 feet, the right engine lost power with no observed warning lights or indications. The pilot stated they lost all electrical power, except for center panel emergency instruments, with the loss of power on both engines. They manually deployed the air-driven generator, or ADG, and recovered power for pilot side instruments, radios, and 3B hydraulic pressure. The right seat pilot declared Mayday, reported the loss of both engines, and requested ATC vectors to the nearest airport. ATC advised the flight crew of several airports in the area, and the crew chose the closest, the Rock County Airport, RBE, in Bassett, Nebraska, for their emergency approach and landing. The pilots reported throughout the emergency the left seat pilot flew the airplane and looked for the airport, while the right seat pilot worked the radios and attempted restarts on both engines and the APU. The flying pilot stated he set up a glide speed of 230 knots, which resulted in a descent rate of about 1,500 feet per minute. He reported he selected the 230-knot airspeed as a compromise to provide the ram air necessary to keep the ADG running, but still maintain a moderate descent rate to allow time to locate the airport and runway and set up for the power-off approach. The right seat pilot stated he made two to three unsuccessful restart attempts on each engine during the emergency descent. He reported he tried to start the APU about seven times without success. 
The right seat pilot also attempted to activate the pilot-controlled runway lighting system without success. The flying pilot reported when the airplane broke out of the overcast, he was able to locate the airport's rotating beacon, but didn't see the runway. He set the airplane up in a descending spiral above the airport and kept looking for the runway. Flying pilot stated when he finally saw the runway, he felt the airplane was too low to make a successful approach and landing. The pilot stated it was so dark they couldn't see anything, so they decided to keep the wings level and land straight ahead. The airplane impacted terrain in an alfalfa field about one mile northwest of the airport. The airplane collided with a barbed wire fence, a cedar tree windbreak, and the free end of a center pivot irrigation rig during the impact sequence. And from a section called Tests and Research, the report says, Samples of contaminated fuel were obtained from the right and left collector tanks, fuel filters, and APU during the on-scene portion of the investigation. Fuel samples collected in the field indicated the right engine fuel system contained more water. This water had a yellowish tint and contained some particulate matter. The left engine fuel system samples yielded smaller portions of clear water contamination. Fuel analysis was performed at the GE Laboratories in Lynn, Massachusetts. Chemical analysis of the samples revealed the distinct layers of liquid were water and jet A fuel, and the solid contaminates appeared to be a non-distinct vegetative matter. Both engines were removed from the airframe and shipped to the GE Aircraft Engines Maintenance Facility at Strother Field, Arkansas City, Kansas, for teardown and examination. Fuel samples taken from the engines and components appeared consistent with fuel samples taken from the fuel tanks during the on-scene investigation. The fuel from both sides exhibited water contamination and some evidence of solid contaminants in the right side components. Major damage to the left engine was limited to thermal damage to the turbine section. The right engine came into contact with a cedar tree hedgerow during the impact sequence. Major damage to the right engine was limited to the fan section where a large cedar branch was jammed and smaller bits of cedar debris were located. Fuel filters, fuel control units, and fuel heaters were removed from both engines and shipped to the vendors for further testing and examination. There was no evidence of pre-impact anomaly in these units. Probable cause, the pilot in command's inadequate planning, decision-making, and inadequate pre-flight inspection after receiving a load of contaminated fuel. Related factors are the contaminated fuel, improper refueling by FBO personnel, and the dark night light conditions. Now, if you look at these two accidents, the most striking thing is that they both experience dual engine flameouts. For the Naples crash, the failures were simultaneous, but for the Nebraska crash, there was some small amount of time between the failures. Both crashes happened after about two hours in flight. The Naples crash was almost exactly two hours after takeoff, and the Nebraska crash was about two and a half hours after takeoff. In both crashes, there was some amount of a yellow liquid found in the fuel. Now, this is not to say that the Naples crash occurred for the same reasons as the Nebraska crash, but it is interesting that dual jet engine failures are extremely rare, and yet the Challenger has had two of them. At this point, it's anybody's guess as to what caused the engines to fail on the Naples plane, and it will probably be a long time before we know anything more about that crash. Over the next 12 to 18 months, the NTSB will be looking at the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder, and I expect that these will hold some key additional clues as to what caused the crash. In the meantime, a key lesson for all of us to take away from the Nebraska crash is that we have to take fuel contamination very seriously. I was really surprised to read in that report that the pilot said to the FBO manager that they believed any water in the fuel would be dispersed due to movement on rough taxiways and mode of flow fuel system. Nonetheless, they did make the right decision and parked the plane to draw fuel samples. But apparently they didn't drain enough fuel as there were still some contaminants in the fuel tanks. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset. 
and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right, coming down. Don't wait until your side's baby sliding upside down.